Okay, we're on. So you, you recall last Sunday evening we started discussing the Trinity. That there is one God, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are all equally and fully God. And so as we look at the Trinity, we need to look at the deity of Jesus. Uh, that's one way you might say of uh, supporting or substantiating the Trinity. As we believe that Jesus is deity, he is uh, of the essence God. So I'll look at, at some points tonight about uh, Jesus being God. You might wonder, well, why is this important? I mean, I know you all believe in the deity of Jesus. I'm not giving this because I don't think you believe in the deity of Jesus. But I think it's good. I think it's healthy for us as Christians just to stop and, and, and meditate on the greatness of Jesus, to meditate on the grandeur of Jesus. While Jesus on earth had a, a flesh and blood human body, he was much more than just a mere mortal human being. He is God. He is deity. And so we remember tonight the majesty of Jesus. And I think this is important because when we think about the person who died for us on the cross, it wasn't just a mere mortal man dying. It was Jesus, the Son of God, deity. And so let's go through these passages. I'll have a little more to say at the very end about the importance of but again, as we read these passages, let's realize we're, we're focusing on the greatness of Jesus, the power, the might, the awesomeness of Jesus. So if you want Jesus, number one, Jesus is actually called God in a number of places in the New Testament. It cannot be any more plain, any more clearer than this, as mentioned in these passages. So if you'd like to follow along, let's start in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we have two references in the Gospel of John. So this is John chapter 1. John is the Gospel where Jesus calls God his Father many, many, many times and refers to himself more so than any other Gospel as God's Son, the Son of God. Is that Father-Son relationship and no doubt sometime we'll discuss that in uh, one of our Bible lessons here. But if you're there in John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now notice this verse says that in the beginning was the Word. And we, we learn later in the chapter from verse 14 that this no doubt is referring to Jesus and, and, a, and his assuming a human body. So the Word there is the Son of God. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. God. He was with the God. He was with God the Father. So that means uh, Jesus goes all the way back to the very beginning, to any beginning, even before creation. And he was there, existing with God, that is, with God the Father. And the Word, this Word who was the Son of God that became flesh, was God. It's not saying he was God the Father. It's saying he was God. He was deity. He was of the essence of of God. He was a, a divine being, if I could put it that way. So to me, this verse is very clear, very plain. Uh, Jesus existed in the very beginning with God the Father. He was always existing with God the Father. God the Father is eternal, therefore Jesus must be eternal. And he is actually called God or called deity. So then if you get down to chapter 20, this is still the Gospel of John. This is now after the resurrection of Jesus. And you remember the story about doubting Thomas. He wouldn't believe until he actually saw Jesus with his own two eyes. And he saw the, the nail prints on his, on his hands. And he felt the, the wound on his side. And then he finally believed. So this is uh, Thomas' testimony. Uh, John chapter 20 and verse 28. So Thomas answered and said to Jesus, My Lord... And my God. That was his confession. After he saw Jesus and he saw the nail prints and he saw the, the wound on his side, he was convinced that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And he confesses that Jesus is his Lord and his what? His God. So Thomas acknowledges Jesus as deity. All right, let's go to the next reference. Colossians chapter 2, if you will. Colossians chapter 2. So if you will, fast forward past uh, Acts. And we go now to the, God, uh, the uh, epistles of the Apostle Paul. 
And we want to go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. And in Colossians, the Apostle Paul is uh, describing the greatness of Jesus. The Apostle Paul is trying to tell these uh, readers, uh, his audience, uh, you don't need anything other than Jesus. Jesus is all you need. He's deity. And in him you're complete. You're not lacking, you're not deficient in anything if you're in union with Jesus. So you don't need to go out and pursue other religions or, or other philosophies. You have it all in Jesus. So notice uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, For in him that is in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That means in Jesus dwells or resides all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And notice verse 10. And here's the good news. And you are complete in him. You're full in him. You have everything you need in Jesus for your eternal well-being. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Jesus is not inferior to the principalities and powers, whether they're angelic beings or even demonic beings or, or spirits or political powers. Jesus is supreme over them. Jesus is supreme over all other beings, subordinate to God the Father, of course. So that's good news. Notice that it says where uh, in Jesus dwells all, not some, not most, but all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And we're complete in him. So that's all good news. And then if you will, let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. So Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Again, this is another verse that mentions Jesus being God, although I do need to explain this just a little bit. So in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, uh, we read, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that's not talking about two different persons there. We're looking forward to the appearing the person that's going to appear is Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is the one who was on earth. He went back into heaven. He promised to come again. So it's Jesus that's going to appear at his second coming. So we're looking forward to that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of... Now notice how Jesus is described. It's the appearing of our great God. Jesus is called our great God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I believe that is a reference to Jesus being referred to as God. He is our great God as well as our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's the one we're waiting for. We're waiting for a mighty deliverer to come back who will set the world right and he will reign in truth and in righteousness. All right, one more reference under this section. Notice Hebrews. If you will, go to Hebrews. You're almost there. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Unsung. No, it's one person. And we know that from the original Greek text, there is one definite article that governs both our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So in the Greek language, they put a, a definite article out in front to show that it's governing uh, both uh, the references there. So I think that's... Here is the complete, complete. I always memorize it every day. And yeah. then but it's, it's not God the Father that's going to come back to earth. It's God the Son that's going to appear. Okay, okay. So we know that the references to our great God, even some translations may say that we're waiting for the appearing of our great God, even the Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, appearing, Yes, yes. Because I've heard that. I've heard, we'll never see God. It's Jesus we're going to see. Right, right. Any, any other questions on Titus 2.13 before we go on? No, I was saying that it's true, and we'll never see God. Right. We're only going to see Jesus. We'll see Jesus. Yeah, but, but Jesus isn't only our great God, but he's our Savior, too. Yes, right. excellent. He's God oh. and Savior. Right, right. He's our yeah. great God and our Savior. Yeah, previously that yeah. appearing, they connected the 
yeah, appearing. It's no, nowhere in the New Testament are we told that it's God the Father that's going to come back at the second coming. The second coming is Jesus coming back. Yeah, it's always Jesus. And so that's just an interesting reference where we have Jesus referred to as our great God as well as our great Savior, uh, none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. So thank you for those questions and clarification. All right, one more reference here. Uh, Hebrews 1, Hebrews chapter 1. So just go over a few pages. Just go past Philemon. And we're in Hebrews. So as you know, in Hebrews, the writer is trying to show the, the, the greatness of Jesus so that these Jews who are believing in Jesus don't give up and renege on their faith because of persecution. If Jesus really is the, the, the Son of God and the, uh, the final sacrifice for our sins uh, to end all sacrifices, then we shouldn't walk away from Jesus because of a little persecution. So here, notice uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. But to the Son, He, that is God the Father, this is what God the Father says of His Son, Jesus. And here we have a quote from the Old Testament. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so my footnote tells me this is a, a quote from uh, Psalm 45, verses uh, 6 and 7. But notice there, God the Father speaks about his Son. God says to his Son, Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So here's another direct statement that Jesus is deity. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go on to my second point. Jesus created all things. So this now places Jesus on a level of equality with God the Father. If God the Father created everything, and Jesus also created everything along with God the Father, then Jesus must be deity. He must have the same power, the same omnipotence as God Almighty, as God the Father. So here we can look at a few references again. Let me just say, since we're already in Hebrews, let's, let's look at the, the last reference first. Okay, notice I have the last reference listed as Hebrews chapter 2, excuse, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. So since we're in Hebrews, let's look at that one first. I don't want to have you go back to John and then have to come back to Hebrews. So uh, just trying to save the page turning tonight a little bit. So here we are, uh, Hebrews. Notice just uh, chapter 1 here, verse 1. God who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, verse 2 has in these last days spoken to us by his, what, his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Through Jesus, God the Father made the worlds. He made the earth and all the worlds, all the galaxies, everything in the universe was made by God through Jesus. So Jesus wields the creative power of God. Notice that verse while I'm here, verse 2 also says that God has appointed Jesus to be the heir of all things. In other words, Jesus will inherit the earth and the universe, and Jesus will rule and reign over the earth as a gift from God the Father. Jesus will have that position of honor, ruling and reigning over the earth. All right, well, let's go back. Um, let's just take them in reverse order. Let's just back up to Colossians, if you will. So go to the Colossians passage. Back to Colossians. And this time we'll do Colossians chapter 1. It's not often I take verses in the reverse order, but tonight, <laughs> for this point, I'll do that. So if you will, just back up to Colossians chapter 1. And verses uh, 15 to 17. A great passage that speaks about the deity of Jesus here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. In other words, we can't see God the Father directly, but if we want to see God, just look at Jesus. Jesus is the image. He's the likeness of the invisible God, the first one, or the preeminent one, over all creation. Now notice verse 16. For by him, that is by Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. 
And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. All things have been brought to being. All things are sustained by Jesus. So that's a very powerful statement about Jesus' creative power. Therefore, Jesus must be on a level of equality with God the Father. Notice at the end of verse 16 that Jesus created all things. All things were created through him and for him. Everything was created to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to be a testimony to his greatness, that everything in the, in, in, in the universe might honor him and that we human beings were created for him as well to honor him, to acknowledge him, to have faith in him, and to carry out his will. All right, going in the reverse order, then the reference we have to look at now is back to John, back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 3. Here again, another great statement. A very powerful statement about the power of Jesus. So, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through him, through the word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Wow! Jesus created everything. Right alongside of God the Father. God the Father created things. Jesus creates things. So Jesus is deity. So let's appreciate the greatness of Jesus. All right, moving along tonight, number three. Jesus accepts worship. He accepts worship. So Jesus never says, oh, don't worship me. I'm not God. Don't worship me. Only worship God the Father. He never says that. He accepts. He receives. He welcomes worship. I think this is another argument for the deity of Jesus. And so we can look, look at a few references here. There's Matthew. Let me back up to Matthew. Matthew 28. So we're at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Of course, you recall at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew when the wise men came to Jerusalem seeking the one who has been born king of the Jews. The star pointed them to Bethlehem. And when the wise men entered where Jesus was, they bowed the knee. They bowed down and they worshipped. So that occurs at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And now the reference I've listed here is at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 17. This is part of the Great Commission passage. And when they, that is Jesus' disciples, saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So maybe some still had some doubts. Um, about him being raised from the dead. Um, I assume that the disciples are there, whether there's any more than the disciples, not sure. It just says in verse 16, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain uh, which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And then, of course, Jesus gave the Great Commission. And then we have uh, back to Hebrews chapter 1. I almost feel like I should have just stayed in Hebrews and did all the Hebrews passages, but... Uh, if you will, go to Hebrews chapter 1 once again, and this time verse 6. Hebrews 1 and verse 6. Again, this is what God the Father has to say about his Son, because God the Father loves his Son. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 6 of Hebrews. But when he, again, that's referring to God the Father, when he, God the Father, again, brings the firstborn into the world, the firstborn, no doubt, is Jesus. Uh, the firstborn of the ancient Jewish family was always the, um, uh, the preeminent one in the family. Uh, so I tend to think of whenever I see the firstborn, I think of the, uh, the preeminent one. So when God the Father brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So God is commanding that all the angels of God should worship his son. Now, God wouldn't command that unless his son was worthy of worship and entitled to worship because Jesus is also deity, just like God the Father. So the angels are commanded to worship the son. And one final reference here. Notice, if you will, Revelation 5. Revelation 5. We have a worship scene in heaven. And the one being worshiped is God the Son, Jesus Christ, who is called the Lamb, 
And he's called the Lamb to forever remind us that he died for us and paid for our sins. And he is the final all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins. But he's not dead, he's alive. He's the powerful, invincible, conquering Lamb. And we have this scene now in heaven in Revelation 5, where Jesus is being praised. In other words, uh, uh, the heavenly beings are singing the praises of Jesus. So therefore, Jesus must be worthy of this worship. He must be deity. So let me just read this now. This is uh, Revelation 5, beginning in verse 8. And when he, he, that is Jesus, had taken the scroll, which represents the right to rule the universe, and to carry out all of God's decrees. So when Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down. So that in itself is an act of worship. Falling down before the Lamb is an act of worship. Each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And now verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four, 24 elders fell down, and they worshipped him who lives forever and ever. So you, did you notice as I read the passage, during the first song of praise, it was the 24 elders and the living creatures that were praising Jesus. And then in the next praise song, the, the group got a lot bigger. Then it was all the angels, thousands and thousands of angels were involved. And then in the last praise song, the, the, the group got even bigger. It was every creature in heaven and on earth and in the sea and, and just everybody. Everything was praising Jesus along with God the Father. So that's a good reference to say that Jesus is worthy of our worship. We can worship Jesus just like we worship God the Father. All right, moving along. Point number four. Jesus is the object of faith. Jesus is the object of faith. In other words, we're invited to believe in Jesus in the same way that we're invited to believe in God, God the Father. And, of course, you can recall in Jesus' day... A devout Jew who is monotheistic would not put his or her faith in Jesus as they would God unless they believed that Jesus was also deity. So let's go back to the Gospel of John. In fact, all of these references are in the Gospel of John, just a, a few here. And then after this, we'll just have one more point for my outline. So let's go to the Gospel of John, if you will. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. A familiar passage the Gospel of John chapter 3, and I'll begin reading in verse 14. And what, what I want you to notice here is that Jesus tells us that we're supposed to believe in him. We should believe in him. It's a good thing. It's what God the Father wants and what God the Son wants. This is John 3. This is John 3, and if you want to put in your notes, verses 14 to 18. Just put in those verses. John chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. So here we read, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of God, a man must be lifted up. That's probably a reference to being lifted up on the cross, because we also know he was lifted up out of the grave and lifted up and ascended back into heaven. But he must be lifted up to the cross, that whos whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved, he loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So uh, Jesus wants us to put our full faith and trust and confidence in him as we would God the Father. So if you will, go to the Gospel of John chapter 14, if you will, chapter 14. And this passage is really clear. I like this. So now we get down to the uh, what we call the uh, upper room discourse. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. He's trying to teach them some things. He doesn't want them to be troubled or anxious or scared because he's going to go away. So Jesus says in chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, Jesus says to them, you are believing in God. You are believing in God the Father, which is what devout Jews are supposed to do. They're supposed to be believing in God the Father. And Jesus commends them for their faith. You are believing in God the Father. And then Jesus commands them. He says, believe also in me. So that's interesting. He just says, you are believing in God the Father. Believe also in me. And in, in, in my way of thinking, what Jesus is saying is, in the same way that you believe in God the Father, you believe in God the Father as deity, as the supreme being over the whole universe who made everything, the only true God. As you believe in God the Father, Jesus says, believe also in me. Put your faith in me, just as you put your faith in God the Father. So Jesus accepts and he wants and he welcomes worship. He wants and trusts and accepts our faith. He wants us to believe in him as well. And one other verse here, I just noted verse 12. Uh, Jesus says in verse 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will also do, because I go to my Father. Maybe a reference to uh, the great works and the many, many, many numerous works that will be done by the church through the power of the risen Lord. So Jesus is a worthy object for our faith because he is deity. One more reference. How else can we argue for the deity of Jesus? Well, we notice in the New Testament, Jesus does things that only God can do. Jesus does things that only God can do. And what are some of the things that Jesus did during his earthly ministry? Well, he cured sick people. He cured people who were blind. He cured people who had leprosy. He cured paralyzed people. He made them well. And there's all other kinds of illnesses that Jesus cured. And he cured people immediately, instantly, thoroughly, completely. And then Jesus also cast out demons. He just ordered them. Uh, it's like when Jesus ordered demons to, to, to be cast out, the, the demons were trembling before Jesus because they understood that Jesus is deity. Then uh, Jesus raises uh, the dead. Remember, he raised Jairus' daughter. He raised the widow's son at Nain. And then he raised Lazarus. So those are at least three times that I can think of that Jesus raised people who were dead. And then Jesus, he calmed the storm, he walked on the water, he turned water into wine, he multiplied the bread and the fish, and he even said that he has the power to forgive sins. And you remember that story from the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Uh, uh, Jesus was teaching in a house, and everybody was packed inside, and uh, four men brought their friend uh, who was paralyzed. They brought him down through the roof. And Jesus, seeing their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. And then a lot of the Jews there, the scribes and the Pharisees, they started whispering and snickering among themselves and, and saying, well, who does this person think he is that he can forgive sins? Well, that's precisely the point. Jesus is deity, and he does have the right and the power and the authority to forgive sin. So if we think of all the things that Jesus did as recorded in the Gospels, we can come to no other conclusion that Jesus wields all of the power of Almighty God the Father, and he himself is deity because he does the things that only God can do. So I trust as we've gone through this tonight, 
uh, your faith is strengthened, and we have a greater sense of respect for the awesome power of Jesus. Now, let me just wrap it up real briefly tonight by saying, why is this important? Well, it's important because then we're supposed to worship Jesus. It's right for us to worship Jesus. Or if I could put this in other words, if Jesus was not deity, we have no business worshiping Jesus. But since he is deity, we should worship Jesus. Uh, and I mentioned, too, that we should keep in mind, then, that the person who died for us on the cross is God. And that means Jesus, as God, is the perfect sacrifice for us. Yes, he's the perfect God-man. He's both God and man, human and deity. And he's the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So this means, then, since Jesus is deity, he's a perfect savior who brings us a perfect salvation. There's nothing missing, nothing lacking, uh, nothing deficient. And then we can think, too, that the one to whom we pray, remember we were singing, what a friend we have in Jesus? We need to take all our sins and griefs and, and bring them to Jesus in prayer. Well, the one to whom we pray is deity. He's God. He's the Son of God. So just be encouraged tonight. The Savior that saved us from our sins is powerful, omnipotent, and he's worthy of our utmost respect. He's worthy of all the respect and honor of which God the Father is worthy and deserving. So let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time tonight just to be reminded of the greatness and the grandeur of your son, Jesus. And we thank you that the New Testament makes clear and plain who Jesus is. He is deity. He is God. And so, Lord, just help us to give Jesus all the honor and the respect and the devotion of which he is worthy. And help us to realize uh, tonight, Lord, that our salvation is complete, it's full, it's done, it's perfect, because Jesus, who accomplished our salvation along with God the Father and the Spirit, is deity. He's powerful. He's omnipotent. So we thank you and praise you for a perfect and full salvation. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Just shut this off. Amen.